Good afternoon, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started for today's session. Uh, April 6th, if we are disconnected for more than 10 minutes or so, um, we can't get back together, please check Canvas a little bit later today for information we would have covered today. So hopefully everyone can hear me okay at this time. Let's do an attendance check-in. Uh, please type present for your attendance in chat. If you did not sign in with your full name, be sure to include it in the message. Outstanding. Okay, uh, a couple of things real quickly before I go into the conversation about our last session. Uh, last night I heard a, uh, I held a general Q and A. Only a few were able to attend, but that is posted now on your Canvas site. Okay. All right. So let's review what we covered during our last official session. We looked at theories of emotion. We looked at how we have a variety of theories out there to explain how emotion comes about. We looked at the James Lang theory where they said body changes happen first and then we experience our emotion. Canon Bard, the body changes comes with the same time that we experience uh, emotion. So it's at the same time simultaneously. And then we see others that looked at uh, Schachter and Singer. Emotion comes about when we cognitively appraise and label an emotion as something, and that is the two-factor theory. And then we saw a couple of theories that looked at how cognition is sometimes bypassed and we have an emotional reaction to something. We might not even have an idea or an awareness of why we have a reaction, it just occurs. So we looked at theories that sort of proposed that as well. All of these sort of explain how it is that we experience emotion. And they're all right to certain degrees, depending on what situation the individual's in. Then we looked at Carol Izzard, and she suggested that they are 10 basic emotions that we have, and we have those emotions at birth because they appear so early in our life. We saw several examples of them. I think there are about seven pictures of some cute babies displaying certain types of emotions that seem to be somewhat global or at least universal, as they refer to it. Then we also examine that there are gender differences in expression as well as detection, with females usually being better at uh, expression as well as detecting emotion in others. And then we see how context cues, the situations around the surrounding a person emoting something, for example, their facial expression, and we can determine what their emotions are by the context, the things around them, not necessarily their facial cues alone. We saw an example where the facial expression was exactly the same, but the context was slightly different, like they were holding their hands a certain way, or there were, there were tears coming out of their eyes. These things give us information that leads us to detect what type of emotion they may be experiencing. And then we ended by looking at facial feedback effect, where the idea is if someone smiles and they're not feeling really that great that day, if they force a smile, they may actually feel better. So the feedback from the face causes a emotion to occur that was not presently there. Okay. So those are a couple of the things that we covered during our last session. Today, we start off with chapter 12, social psychology. All right, so what is social psychology? How do individuals respond to other people? That's what it really comes down to. How do we respond to other people? The presence of other people. You can see from this photograph here, this is pre-pandemic here, but the idea is that people, when they are around others, they can be influenced and influence them. So we're looking at social psychology and how the presence of other people makes some sort of change in us. So looking at the overview of what we'll be covering, we'll look at how we think in relation to other people. How do we think in relation to other people? How other people influence not only our thinking, but our actions. We'll look at conformity, obedience, and group behavior. How we treat each other or relate to each other. Looking at such things as prejudice, attraction, aggression, altruism, conflict and peacemaking. We'll look at a few of these, but not all of them in a little bit more detail this week. So let's start off with social psychology by understanding exactly what it is and compare it to personality psychology as well. So here's a sample social psychology question. Why might 
students speak up in class or hesitate to speak? To answer this, we can study emotions, cognitions, motivations or reinforcers, all the things that we've covered so far uh, in this course. We can look at these things to describe why it is a person may or may not speak up in class. Are they reinforced, for example? Do they have the motivation to do so? And things of that nature. But we can also look at it this way. Personality psychologists could study the traits that make one person more likely than another to speak. Now, we haven't covered personality yet, but personality is basically that consistent way that you think, feel, and behave across a variety of situations. And so personality is very, very important part of who the person is, your identity. Now, the other thing that we can look at is social psychologists. Social psychologists might examine the aspects of the classroom, the situation that would influence any student's decision about speaking. So personality psychologists look at traits of the individual and at that particular individual, and social psychologists look at the situation, okay, that may have some sort of influence on whether or not a particular student will speak or not. So let's look at deeply here what we mean by social, social psychology and social thinking, which are, is an important aspect of it. So we'll be looking at such things as the fundamental attribution error, attitudes and actions affecting each other, looking at peripheral and central routes of persuasion, and foot in the door phenomena, role playing, affecting attitudes, as well as the cognitive dissonance, where actions affect your beliefs. Okay, let's get started. So first, let's talk about attribution. Now, when we talk about an attribution, we're talking about coming up with a conclusion about the cause of, the, of an observed behavior or event. We attribute something. We attribute a cause. We want to identify causes. So that's a key ingredient of social psychology and social thinking. When someone behaves a certain way, when someone gets back with a significant other, which they always fight with, and you say, why did they do that? Or someone starts to say they quit their job before they got another, why did they do that? You want to identify the causes to these things. And so in attribution theory, we explain others' behavior with two types of attributions, two types of causes. So we're always looking to, to, to see why someone, a close friend of ours, behaves a certain way or does certain things. We can do it one or two ways. We can look at the situational attribution. This is factors outside the person, external to the person. The actions such as peer pressure, they are exerting forces on the individual that cause them to behave a certain way. Or we can look at dispositional attribution. This is the person's stable, enduring traits, their personality, their ability, their emotions. So situational is external to the person. That's what's caused this. Dispositional are internal to the person. It's just who they are. So in attribution theory, we have these two ways that we can attribute someone's behavior to the situation or to the disposition, their personality. So with all that we have learned about people so far in this course, you should make a pretty good guesses about the nature of other people's behavior, right? We, especially those raised in Western individualist cultures tend to make an error, however. We tend to make an error quite regularly. And we refer to this error as the fundamental attribution error the fundamental attribution error. So what is this error exactly? So if you see if you can find the following error in the following comment here. I noticed a new guy tripping and stumbling as he walked in. How clumsy could he be? Does he never watch where he's going? So you can see from this statement, these statements here, that the person has already sort of chosen a dispositional attribution for this person's behavior. So what is the error? The next day, hey, they need to fix this rug. I tripped on it on the way in. Okay, not everyone tripped. Well, not everyone had a test that day and their cell phone was buzzing. So we see now a variety of external 
or situational attributions to that behavior that we saw previously. We have more information. But we automatically, those of us who were born in Western cultures like here, we automatically tend to go with the dispositional cause to a behavior because that is what we look at as the fundamental attribution error. When we go too far and assuming that a person's behavior is caused by their personality, that is the error that we commit. And we commit that error primarily because of the type of culture we have. And we'll see more about that in a second. But an individualist culture really focuses a great deal on, guess what? The individual. So everything is seen slightly from the individual's perspective. So we tend to make this attribution error more often, assuming that a person's behavior is caused by their personality. So we think a behavior demonstrates a trait. They did this because that's the way they are. He stumbled because he never pays attention. He's clumsy. That's the way he is. So we tend to overemphasize the dispositional attribution or the internal attribution, attribution and underemphasize the situational attribution. So we focus more on the personality and less on the situations. That is what we tend to do. And that is, in essence, the fundamental attribution error. Now let's see how this really plays out in some experiments, some classic experiments that was done on this particular topic. So we make this error even, even when we are given the correct facts. A Williams College study was done. A woman was paid and told to act friendly to some students and unfriendly to others. The students felt that her behavior was part of her disposition even when they were told that she was just obeying instructions. So let me emphasize what they're saying here. So they would view some videos, for example, of a woman acting either friendly or unfriendly to some students, okay? And they were then told that, they, that she was paid or told or ordered to do this. She was just obeying instructions. But despite all of that information, despite what they were told as to this was her order, these were her orders, they still said, well, that's what she felt anyway. She really didn't like those people or she really liked those students. So despite the fact of having that correct information, we still saw it as a, as a dispositional trait, as a dispositional attribution, as an internal factor of the woman. So that's incredible that despite the facts being put in front of you, you still believe what you're going to believe, okay? Uh, I'm gonna pause real quickly there to see if there are any questions. I'm not get too excited about social psychology here. Are there any questions or comments uh, that you wanna make? You can just speak up or shoot me a chat message. Okay, cool. All right, so next we wanna look at another aspect of social thinking, self versus other or actors and observers. Now, this is an interesting one here because this is almost like the opposite of what we've been talking about, the fundamental attribution error. When we explain our own behavior, we partly reverse the fundamental attribution error. So when we are the one who is acting in such a way and we have to judge our behavior, we look at it differently. So we tend to blame the situation for our failures although we take personal credit for our successes. Blame situation for our failures and take personal credit for our successes. So we sort of turn it inside out to a degree. This happens not just for our out of selfishness, it happens whenever we take the perspective of the actor when we're doing the act in the situation, which is easiest to do for ourselves and people we know well. So this actor observer bias is what you could probably call it. This actor observer bias basically says that when we are the one doing the acting here, we blame the situation for our failures and take credit for the success. Now that's for ourselves, but also we do the same thing for people that we know well. 
because we know well, we, we know them well, we sort of cut them a little bit of slack and we treat them almost as if we would treat ourselves. Now let's look at why some of this may be going on. It goes back to culture, cultural differences. And we've talked about culture a time or two already in this course. We've thrown out terms like collectivist and individualist type of cultures. So people in collectivist cultures, those which emphasize group unity, allegiance, and purpose over the wishes of the individual do not make the same kind of attributions that people from individualistic cultures like ours does. So we, as an individualist culture, do not emphasize group unity or allegiance or wishes, purposes over the wishes of the individual. We do the exact opposite, in fact. We focus on the individual rights, okay? We look at people who go their own way to go against the pack. These are things which we see as good, okay? In the collectivist culture, they would not be. So let's look at what types of attributions the culture, which is collectivist, actually do make. Well, one, the behavior of others is attributed more to the situation, which is the exact opposite of what we do because of the FAE, the fundamental attribution error. So there is more attuned to attributing it to the situation. Two, credit for success is given more to others. Three, blame for failures is taken on oneself. So these things are not what we would normally see of individuals from our culture, okay? An individualist culture as opposed to a collectivist culture. Now, let me give you a couple of examples that I have used before. Uh, I teach, Industrial Organizational Psychology, Psych 350. And I used to show this video of an interview going on between two uh, separate candidates for a particular job. One was a Caucasian male, white male. Another one was an Asian female. And uh, you could see that the uh, white male was identified as an average student, a C student, uh, didn't do a lot of the extracurricular activities. The Asian female was identified as an A student and many uh, extracurricular activities, very well suited for the position in many, many ways. And we saw them give an interview uh, uh, with a company, a Western com company. So a, a company located, let's say in the United States. And the interviews were totally different. Now the individual who was from the Western individualistic culture, they were able to talk to talk about themselves in very highfalutin terms. They, they, they did this, they did that. They put themselves in the best light possible, always taking success on as their due because they were good at what they did. Whereas the individual who was the uh, female from a collectivist culture, she didn't do that when they would make comments about how well she did in school with all these activities, she'd say something like, I had good teachers, or I had a good program that I was in. And anytime there was something that was somewhat negative, she'd take the blame on for herself. So when you are interviewing people from a very diverse area and you could have people coming in from all backgrounds, uh, it's very good for the person who's doing the interviewing to know these different cultural differences in order to make sure that people are getting the best, best fair shake when they are being interviewed because of these cultural differences. Now, the other thing that you may have a little bit more familiarity with, if you watch any sports whatsoever, uh, in sporting events, when you have the post-game interview, and let's say it's a basketball game, a post-game interview, and you interview somebody from our particular culture, an individualistic culture like ours, uh, and they're talking about the game, and you know they know that it's always good to not shine the light on you, even though you scored 50 points that game. You want to talk about how well your team did. And sometimes you'll notice when they do that, and they're talking about how well their team did. Uh, well, we performed well today. We passed the ball. We did great rebounding. We, we really worked well with our defense. Sometimes it sounds very awkward the types of things they're saying because it's not natural to them because it really isn't. They would prefer to be talking about themselves, about what they did, that they scored 50 points, they had 
15 rebounds, three steals, all this type of stuff. That's what their culture tells them is the right thing to do. Now, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you seen one of these post-game interviews when they're interviewing someone and they're trying to put the light on their team, but it seems very difficult for them. It's like it's not, not their nature at all. Yeah, so we do see that. Now, I remember a few years ago, there was a player from China. He was like really tall, I forget his name right now, but he was like seven foot plus. And they would interview him. This was for a professional game. Uh, they interviewed him after the post game, I mean, during the post game. And he would say about how well the team was doing. And it sounded absolutely natural. And when he would talk about himself, when they would try to force him to talk about himself and his performance that night, that's when he seemed to feel awkward about it. So we can see these two different responses to the post-game interview, depending on what culture you're from, you're from. And it's really amazing when you think about that's all about culture, how you were raised, what is important for your particular culture. All right? So, so. All right. Now, the other thing I want to talk about are attitudes in actions, attitudes and actions. So what is an attitude first? An attitude are feelings, ideas, and beliefs that affect how we approach and react to other people, objects, and events, okay? Attitudes by definition affect our actions. Now we shall see later that our actions can also influence our attitudes. All right, so let's look real quickly here at this key area of persuasion. Now, we try to persuade people often every day, okay? Even if you're trying to persuade your group of friends about where to, where to go for lunch or what movie to go see, okay? But we always want to persuade them. So there are two cognitive pathways to affect attitudes to persuade someone, to change their attitude about something, all right? The first is going to be the central route persuasion. With central route persuasion, we're going directly through the rational mind, influencing the attitudes with evidence and logic and rationality. So in here, my product has been proven more effective. So you have data to sort of back it up. That's the central route of persuasion, using logic and evidence to persuade someone. Then we have the peripheral route of persuasion, changing attitudes by going around the rational mind. So you don't want to deal with the rational mind here. You go around the rational mind and you appeal to people's fears, desires, and associations. So people who buy my product are happy and attractive, all right? So basically what it comes down to is this. You may have heard of this term before, and I'm sure you have. We have to win people's hearts and minds, okay? Hearts and minds. The mind is the central route of persuasion. The heart is the peripheral route of persuasion. Now, it is somewhat difficult to persuade people sometimes with the central route of persuasion, simply because they have to think. They have to be able to be engaged enough to listen to the evidence, to weigh the arguments, to use logic and think rationally and critically. And again, that's when we started this course, we, we told you that one of the things that we wanted to try to do by the time we're finished with this course is to make you better critical thinkers so that you can analyze and make better decisions. So this is one of the reasons why we want to do this because the central route of persuasion, you can be persuaded, but you have to put some work into it to be persuaded. That's why oftentimes when people really want to get somebody persuaded quickly, they don't go with the central route. They go with the peripheral route. They go with the heart. They go with emotional appeals. They go with trying to get you emotionally excited or afraid or angry at something. They're gonna put uh, mom, apple pie, the flag, children, you know, all this type of stuff to get you emotionally invested. When that happens, you do not necessarily engage your rational mind. Now, it can be more quickly persuade someone by using the peripheral route, but you have to 
keep going back to the emotional well, so to speak, to keep recharging it. Okay, because once you get somebody with the central route, once you logically got them, you usually have them. But the peripheral route needs greater dosages, a continued dose of emotionality in order to get them and keep them persuaded, so to speak. All right. Any questions about that? Those two basic ideas of winning the heart or the mind. Okay, good. All right. So, so the next thing we, we talk about here is looking at how these attitudes affect our actions. When do we see attitudes actually impacting our actual behavior? Well, there are four things here. External influences are minimal. The attitude is stable. The attitude is specific to the behavior and the attitude is easily recalled. So let's look at an example. McDonald's. I feel like eating McDonald's. That's an attitude. Okay. It's a very positive attitude toward eating McDonald's. And I will. Okay. That's your action. When is this most likely to take place that you have this attitude and this action will follow? Well, it will take place most likely when external influences are minimal. That means there are no nutritionists there telling you not to eat this high calorie junk food. The attitude is stable. I've enjoyed their food for quite a while. So this is something that is not new to you. It's a stable attitude. The attitude is specific to the behavior. It's so easy to get the food when I have this craving. And four, the attitude is easily recalled. It's easy to remember how good it is when I drive by that big sign every day when you see those golden arches shaped like an M, all right? So this is when our attitude is most likely going to affect our actions and influence, obviously, our behavior. Now, let's look at some social cognitive mechanisms. And what this basically means is this. If attitudes direct our actions, can it work the other way around? How can it happen that we can take an action which in turn shifts our attitude about that action? So here we're looking at the, the flip of this. We're looking now at our actions changing our attitudes, okay? So through three social cognitive mechanisms, this happens. The foot in the door phenomena, the effects of playing a role or role playing, and cognitive dissonance. So again, if attitudes direct our actions, can it work in the other way around? How can it happen that we can take an action which in turn shifts our attitude about that action? Let's see how it works. So we have a political campaigner ask you, would you open the door just enough to pass a clipboard through or a foot, all right? You agree to this. Then you agree to sign a petition. Then you agree to make a small contribution by check. What happened here? What happened here? Now, let me give you an idea of why this is called foot the door technique. Years and years ago, when we had a lot more door to door salesmen, uh, there would be the vacuum, clean, vacuum cleaner salesmen. And they would go around, usually around the 1950s, I guess, and they would try to sell the vacuum cleaners, usually to the homemaker, who would usually be the wife who was still at home during the middle of the day. And oftentimes, they would need to get the door to be open as they're talking to the, the, uh, the, the, the housewife. And if the housewife wanted to try to close the door, they would, this would not work today, they would put their foot in the door to stop it from being closed, okay? So they would be able to talk a little bit longer to try to get some sort of compliance, all right? That's where the term foot in the door technique comes in. Now, what's happening here is the following thing. Why did they agree to do this and then agree to do that? The foot in the door phenomenon is that the tendency to make more likely to agree to a large request after agreeing to a smaller request. That's all. A tendency to be more likely to agree to a larger request after agreeing to a smaller request. 
So if you get them to do one thing, agree to it, then you're more likely to get them to agree to something else. Now here's the effect on the attitude. People adjust their attitudes along with their actions. So if you find yourself behaving a certain way, then you have to sort of adjust your attitude to be aligned with your behavior. So people adjust their attitudes along with their actions, liking the people they agree to help, disliking the people they agree to harm. Okay, so when you agree to open the door a little bit, when you agree to take that, that clipboard, and when you agreed to do the next thing, you're more likely to give them the check. Let me give you an example. Now, I've been in this situation a couple of times. Maybe some of you have or not. I'm not sure. You go and do some shopping, eye shopping at a car dealership. You're not you're maybe in the market to buy a car, maybe not, but you're seriously there, you're thinking about it, and you're there in the lot, and then the salesperson walks up to you, okay? They start doing the normal chat that they normally do, getting you talking about all sorts of things, the game, the weather, what have you, and then they get you to offer a certain thing for you to do, to comply with. Hey, do you wanna sit in this car? Now, some of you know where I'm going with this. Do you want to sit in this car and you agree to it? So you've agreed to it. Hey, you want to start her up? Yeah, sure, why not? You start her up. Next thing you know, you're doing, doing the test drive of the car. And the next thing you know, you're sitting in the office and then you are signing paperwork to buy a car. I'm going to ask you right now, Yes, okay. The idea is that they keep building everything, but th at the same time, they're getting you to comply to smaller requests and each time you say yes to that small request, you're more likely to say yes to the larger request. That happens all the time. And that's why some people are really good at sales jobs. They do that thing. They get the small compliance to the large compliance. So they are building their case all the time. So the other thing we wanna talk about is something called role playing. Role playing affects attitudes. Okay, let me read you a couple of quotes real quickly here. No man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be the true face. Or fake it till you make it. What this is basically saying is that sometimes you put a face, a public face on. But if you do that so often and so long, you may start to believe the public face is the real face. That's what this is sort of alluding to here. So when we play a role, even if we know it is just pretending, we eventually tend to adopt the attitudes that go with the role and become the role. That's what this is saying, that you fake it till you make it. You play a particular person or type of character, and then you may start to believe that you are and everything that comes along with that particular type of character comes along with all the attitudes and the behaviors that this person, you believe this person or type of person should have, that becomes yours. Now, in arranged marriages, people often come to have deep love for the person that they marry. Actors say they lose themselves in roles. Okay, so the idea here, there are certain type of acting methods, what is called method acting, where you really uh, immerse yourself in a particular character. <clears throat> For example, let's say some actor is going to play a homeless person. They may literally live on the streets for a month or two. Seriously, everything they do, they're not going to go back to the hotel room or to their house. They're going to live on the streets for a month or two as a homeless person so they really understand the role and they become that role. Now, a tragic story may be part of this as well. A tragic story which may relate uh, to this second bullet of the actors may lose themselves in a the role. Uh, some of you may remember, if you're old enough, an actor called Heath Ledger. Uh, who complained before his death that he was becoming disturbed by the attitudes that he had adopted while immersing himself in the role of the Joker in one of the Batman movies. Okay, so shortly after uh, he finished that movie, uh, he wound up 
dying and and people thought that he'd really gotten really depressed and sort of lost himself in a particular role. Does anybody remember that by any chance? I don't know how old you guys are, but uh, this was several years ago uh, in one of the previous Batman movies. And he played the uh, crazy maniacal version of the Joker that we see played more often these days. He was the first one to play it that way. And I think uh, Jared Leto, I think is the one that we see now who play it. But I think uh, Heath Ledger was the first one to really play the really in crazy, insane Joker uh, in one of the Batman movies. And so the idea here is that you can sometimes lose yourself in a role. Now, this leads to this classic study uh, that was done in Stanford, the Stanford Prison Studies, of which they also made a movie about this, by the way. Uh, participants in the Stanford Prison Study ended up adopting the attitude of whatever roles they were randomly assigned to play. Guards had the demeaning views of prisoners and prisoners had rebellious dislike for the guards. Let me give you a really quick rundown or description of the prison study. Uh, so Philip Zimbardo wanted to study about roles and he made arrangements for, for college students at Stanford to be randomly assigned to be a prison guard or a prisoner and a study that was supposed to last two weeks. Uh, they had arranged for the people who were randomly assigned to be prisoners to be picked up by the local sheriff's department, I believe, arrested and hauled off, not to jail necessarily, but to the psychology building, or uh, one of the buildings on campus, where in the basement they had created a prison, a mock prison. And so these prisoners were supposed to remain in prison for two weeks. And the guards who were other subjects in the experiment would have eight hour shifts. They'd be able to go home at night and all this type of stuff, depending on when their shift was. And they had to end the study early. Things got way out of hand. And the reason they did this is because they started to become their roles. Guards, the people who were playing the guards really became maniacal and very sadistic toward the prisoners. The prisoners became very rebellious. In fact, Philip Zimbardo played the warden and he even lost himself in his role as a warden. He literally forgot that he was doing an experiment and had certain responsibilities and behaviors as the lead of the experiment. So this Stanford prison study just points to the fact that we can truly get lost in our roles. And so role playing does affect attitudes. Whatever the role you're playing and the attitudes that you believe are part of that role, those are the ones that you adopt and they change your attitudes. All right, any questions or comments about that? Who was the best joker? Heath Ledger was, but okay. the, the same issue was uh, Joaquin Phoenix when he did the uh, a remake of it. I believe he also had the same disposition. Yeah, one of some of the best actors I understand are the ones who really do uh, use this method acting approach. Uh, Christian Bale, I guess, who actually played uh, one of the Batman's at one point, uh, he got into some physical uh, issue because he was in a uh, in a movie, I think it was called The Machinist or The Mechanic or something like that. And he lost like 50 or 60 pounds. He was bone thin. And he, he, he always put him, his health in danger because he wanted to get into the role. Okay. And so some of these actors really do harm themselves because of this method style of acting that they do. So the role is a very powerful thing. Playing a role can literally influence your attitudes to actually change. Now, the other idea is cognitive dissonance. So let's give you with this example first and we'll talk more about it after this. So cognitive dissonance, let's look at Fiona. Fiona is a college student and she believes the tuition at her school is way too high, all right? That's her belief. Then Fiona gets a job where she needs to call and solicit money, okay, from the alumni and from others for fundraising. So if Fiona agrees to do some fundraising for her college, her attitudes about school finances might shift to resolve her cognitive dissonance. Now, what we mean by cognitive dissonance is this. If you have an attitude and a behavior which are in conflict with each other, 
okay? This is when you have the awareness of your attitude and behavior are inconsistent. It causes some concern within you. It causes what they refer to as distance, some discomfort. And that discomfort sort of starts to eat at you. And so you have to do something to resolve it. So the idea is normally what happens with cognitive dissidence, in order to resolve that dissidence, you change your attitude, not your behavior. Now think of it from, from Fiona's point of view. Fiona is getting paid to do fundraising. So that in of itself is reinforcing that behavior. People got to eat, right? So most likely that behavior has a lot going for it because she's getting reinforced for it. So that behavior is not probably not going to change, but she still has that dissidence, that discomfort. In order for her to be okay by doing this, something has to give. And what gives in this instance is her attitude. Her attitude shifts, she changes it. So let's look real closely at what we mean by cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when our actions are not in harmony with our attitudes. Cognitive dissonance theory is the observation that we tend to resolve this dissonance by changing our attitudes to fit our actions. So that's what it comes down to. When we have this dissonance, we tend to change our attitudes to fit our actions. Okay, so let's look at where this came from. The origin of cognitive dissonance theory happened uh, when there was a study by Leon Festinger, uh, 1957. Students were paid either a large or small amount of money to express enjoyment of a boring activity. So they did a boring activity and they were either paid a large sum of money to say, oh, yeah, I enjoyed it, I liked it, or a small amount of money to say, oh yeah, I enjoyed it, I liked it then many of the students changed their attitudes about the activity. So they would measure what they really thought about the activity as well. So this is what happened. Getting paid more, I was paid to say that. So their attitude really did not change. They know quite clearly I was paid to say that. But if they got paid less, okay, they paid less, why would I say it was fun? Just for a dollar, that's weird. Maybe it wasn't so bad now that I think of it. So they had to shift their attitude about that activity to make it justifiable as to what they did and what they experienced, okay? So that's the, the, the thing about cognitive dissonance. When you have the dissonance, it's more likely to change the attitude to fit your actions. Okay, so the next ideas we wanna talk about is deal with social influence, social influence. And here we're gonna talk about cultural influences, about conformity, mimicry, uh, obedience factors and lessons from that, and group situations and group behavior, social facilitation, loafing. We'll probably see that in our next session. Okay, let's go on here. All right, so let's look at cultural influences. First, culture. We've talked about it a couple of times already, but now let's get a little bit more deeply into what we mean by culture. Culture are the behaviors and beliefs of a group. Beha behaviors and beliefs of a group is shared and passed on to others, including the next generation of a group. So you are, you guys out there listening to me now, you are part of a culture, a larger culture of the United States, a smaller culture of whatever state you're from, uh, whatever neighborhood, uh, other characteristics, but the culture is passed down from your parents and they got it from their parents and so on and so forth, all the way back to generations and generations ago. These are the beliefs and behaviors that a group shares, all right? This sharing of traditions, values, and ideas, okay, form a social influence that helps to maintain that culture. So when we have a culture, we have to maintain it, okay? And norms are the rules, often unspoken, but commonly understood that guide behavior for a culture. Norms are part of the culture, but also part of the way social influence works to maintain that culture. So cultures do change over time. Norms from marriage have changed 
and divorce have changed in Western culture. Uh, I may have mentioned this once before. Uh, the idea is that when you get married, it used to be really young. Now it's much older. Okay, we see uh, what women are expected to do in their life. There's a lot more range of possibilities now than it was in the culture decades ago. All right, uh, norms are out there as well. For example, if you had a baby in a baby carriage and you were going to a restaurant to eat lunch with some friends, how many of you who have babies or can imagine having them would park your baby carriage out in front of the restaurant and then proceed to go into the restaurant, meet your friends and have lunch? How many people would do that? Anybody? No. Okay, no, 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 no. Now that does not happen in our culture. It doesn't. We would not dare do that. But in other cultures, even, even cultures which are considered Western cultures, do that all the time. Uh, there would be pictures, sometimes you see them, I don't know if we have one in our textbook or not, where you'd be looking at a row of baby carriages out in front of a restaurant, loads of babies outside of the restaurant in the nice sunny day, okay, where their parents are inside eating lunch. Different norms, okay? So obviously in that particular culture, they don't have worries about babies being kidnapped, which is something that we do in our culture a lot more than other, other cultures do. So cultures differ. We even see the same thing about alcoholic beverages. Uh, we do not want our 13 year olds drinking beer and things like that. But in some other cultures, even Western cultures, uh, in Europe, they drink beer fine. So the idea is that even within a culture, there are other subcultures too that dictate what the norms are or norms aren't. So we need to understand these cultural influences, social influences are very powerful on us. We have norms for everything. We have norms for how you enter into an elevator, for example, you know, and you never had to, you never was taught this. You know, you walk into an elevator, the doors open, you walk into the elevator, you turn around, and if somebody else is standing close to the, the, the buttons, you ask them politely to please select whatever floor you want. Now, what would happen if you are still on the elevator, it goes up a couple of floors, the doors open, it's not your floor yet, so you stay there. Somebody walks in and keeps walking to the very back of the wall behind you and just stand facing the wrong way. Well, that would sort of weird you out, wouldn't it? Okay, the idea is that that goes against the norms of our society. Even though we never read a textbook somewhere that says, uh, Johnny or, or Diane, when you enter into the uh, elevator, face this way, not that way. No one had to tell you that, you learned it, okay? So those are some of the things that are sort of passed down. Sometimes these things we see, sometimes these rules just we know, but we never had to be taught them, okay? So let's talk real quickly here about this notion of conformity. All right, so we have these norms, but now we have conformity. What form of social influence is subject of this cartoon? Banking on the youth market, you see this older guy, and this older gentleman, someone out of shape. Be like all your friends, express your individuality, open, tattoo and piercing. This is what conformity is all about. And conformity, usually it's very interesting, oftentimes talks about expressing your individuality, but at the same time, it's talking about you conforming as well. All right, so what is this conformity? Conformity refers to adjusting our behavior or thinking to fit in with a group standard. The power of conformity has many components and forms, including automatic mimicry affecting our behavior, social norms affecting our thinking, and normative and informational social influence. So all these things play a role in conformity, all right? So let's look at mimicry. It's not only true that birds of a feather flock together, it's also true that if we flock together, we might choose to wear the same feathers. So these individuals may be mimicking each other. They may be 
be also disconforming, but also conforming at the same time. As long as they can disconform to another group that dresses differently, they're dressing this way. But mimicry is something that's very important. So there's also automatic mimicry. Some of our mimicry of other people is not by choice, but automatic. We have the chameleon effect, unintentionally mirroring the body position and mood of others around us, leading to contagious yawning, contagious arm folding, hand wringing, or face rubbing. You may notice you do this sometimes yourself. Let's say you're around somebody like I am, you know, I'm, you never can see me because I usually don't have the video camera on, but my hands are moving like crazy because I gesticulate. I move my hands and arms when I'm talking. All right. Sometimes when you're talking to somebody like that, you may see that you start to move your hands a little bit more than you normally do as well. Okay. That's a, a, an effect called the chameleon effect. Now, sometimes this is a way that we sort of connect to other people as well. And then we have the empathetic shifts in mood that fit the mood of people around us. So if they're in a certain mood, you may sort of align your mood to be more aligned with them. Okay, now why this happens again, at some level, what's happening is you're sort of like making a connection to them. Okay, you're sort of starting to agree with them a little bit and see some sort of connection that I'm just like you, I'm moving my hands too. All right, copying the actions of others, including forms of violence, hopefully if also forms of kindness. So we see that this mimicry can be happening at an automatic unconscious level as well. We don't necessarily know that we're doing it, but we just wind up doing it. Now, the, the thing about it is that this does happen and it does sort of help to connect us to other people. So this slide here is about unconscious mim mimicry. Uh, yeah, someone I asked, as you probably can see here, does chameleon effect cover mimicry and voice? Uh, I believe for some people it may. Uh, you can see that some people may be uh, more open to, to other individuals where their voice may change in quality as well to sort of mimic theirs. And of course, sometimes it can even change in a certain type of accent as well. Now, some people it'll happen more easily than others. I'm one of those too, okay, where uh, my, my voice quality may change depending on what I am. My wife totally disagrees because she says I'm just loud all the time. That's being an instructor, I just talk loud. But the idea is that we can see this happen with some people. It's not necessarily something they do purposefully but it does something that happens. Now, in this classic study here, let me just give you the, the rundown of what we see here. In this classic study, uh, subjects noticeably copied the experimenter who was actually a stranger to them as measured by face touching and foot raggling. But the key thing that I wanted to highlight here, the act of face touching increased 20% but the rate of foot raggling or foot shaking increased by 50% when participants were inspired by another foot raggler or foot shaker. So the idea here is that if you give somebody a Confederate shakes their foot, it can entice you to do the same thing. So we do have that tendency. Now, remember, we talked about this in the previous uh, section as well about those mirror neurons that we have. We, we're sort of designed from being very young kids and infants to mimic Okay, and so we can't say that we've gotten rid of all that type of thing uh, as an adult. So we may see this as a way to connect with other people, okay, as it was a way for us to learn when we were much younger, to learn to, to get certain skill sets and things of that nature. Here is a way to connect to other people by mimicking them. Now, obviously, if it becomes very obvious that you're mimicking them, it can have the exact opposite effect. Okay, so the idea here is that that we see with the chameleon effect that we have a great way to connect to other people. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, is the chameleon effect different from assimilation or adaptation? Uh, it probably has some relationship to them in that when you are communicating with somebody, uh, you are trying to make a connection with them. And so you may be adapting in a, in a sense by trying to make a connection with them. And that's where a little bit of the mimicking come, uh, goes along. 
you're trying to connect with them. So maybe not much assimilation or adaptation as, as opposed to a connection, trying to have a, 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 a point of overlap where the people feel like you're like them. And to a large degree, that's what we do, we're trying to do. We're trying to tell people when we are communicating with them that we're not that different, that we are similar to each other. And that's when we can sort of have that little bit of overlap by showing them in some way, by sounding like them, by gesticulating like them uh, in that way. And so it can lead to a better relationship or connection. We do this too, by the way, when we are, uh, on our best behavior doing a job interview. We may do things to try to make us seem similar to the person that is interviewing us, for example. So again, I can see it adaptation and assimilation maybe, but not in the ways that we've talked about it so far uh, in this particular class. Now, let's look at some social norms here. When we are with other people and perceive a social norm, a correct or a normal way to behave or think in, the, in this particular group, our behavior may follow the norm rather than following our own judgment. All right, so this is key here. We have a norm. Remember, norms are sort of like the policeman in a way. Uh, we have this norm and the norms are usually established to maintain the culture or maintain the sanity of a group, for example, that these are the rules for this particular group. So if you wanna be with this group, then you must follow our particular norms. Now, this goes back to one of the classic studies done by Solomon Ash, Ash's conformity studies. And what they found is about one third of the people will agree, will agree with obvious mistruths to go along with the group. Now, I want to emphasize this. What we are saying here is this, the people know that this is not correct, but they will conform anyway. They know that what is being stated is wrong, a lie, a falsehood, or incorrect, but they will go along anyway. And that's what this is basically saying. So about one third of the people will agree with obvious mistruths just to conform with the group. In this example, we have these two gentlemen saying, that square has five sides, that square has five sides, and this guy is saying, what the, I don't know. But the idea is this, most likely that person will conform, okay? One third of the people will agree with an obvious mistruth. Now we'll see why that is in a minute, but the notion is, in Solomon Ash's study, what they did is they had the following scenario. They would have a standard line and then they would have a bunch of comparison lines and they would have a group of people. Now, when they had the group of people, one of the people in the group was the true subject of the experiment. Everyone else in this group were confederates or working with the experimenter. So they go through several rounds when I say, which line is the same as the standard line, two, 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 two. And they'd say that and go through several rounds of that. Then at one point, they would do something that was obvious, obviously wrong. And they wanted to see if that one person who's the true subject, would they go with the wrong answer or with the right answer, okay? Would they agree with the crowd or go with the correct answer? And again, a third of the, 30% or so, they would always go with the crowd, the wrong answer. So think about it this way in a realistic scenario. When you know something is wrong or a mistruth or not factual, and you have a, an opportunity to go and say the truth or go along with the group, you run that scenario in your head. What happens if I go along with the group or if I disagree with the group? So oftentimes, we don't want to have to deal with that scenario. Therefore, we go along with the group. We conform to the larger group. So what makes you more likely to conform? What makes you more likely to conform? So here are the answers to that. You're more likely to conform you are not, if you are not firmly committed 
to one set of beliefs or style of behavior. So if you're not really committed, and definitely if you've not stated anything beforehand, but if you're not really committed to one way or another, you're more likely to conform. The group is medium-sized and unanimous. Medium-sized, if you get to much larger groups, then there's much more likelihood that somebody may disconform and that destroys the whole thing of unan un un unanimity. So when you wanna have a unanimous group, you want to make sure that it's a medium-sized, not too large, so that it can be unanimous with no dissenting ideas. If it is a group of medium size and it's unanimous, you're more likely to conform. You admire or are attracted to the group. So you wanna be a member of this group or wanna maintain your membership in this group. You're more likely to conform to a mistruth. If you know it's a mistruth, it doesn't really matter to you anymore because it's more important for you to be part of this group you admire or you are attracted to. The group tries to make you feel incompetent, insecure, and closely watched, so they have an eye on you. So if your group has this going for it, well, those people are idiots if they believe that, or they make you feel insecure, or uh, they keep watching you, the idea then you're more likely to conform. And your culture encourages respect for norms. So, so these are the factors that make it more likely for an individual to conform. You're not firmly committed to one way or another. The group is medium sized and it's unanimous the way that they want you to conform to. You are admired or attracted to the group. The group tries to make you get punished if you don't conform to them and your culture encourages respect for norms. Now, ours really doesn't have that great respect for norms. Uh, it depends on the situation, obviously, because uh, we are somewhat individual, individualistic type of culture, but depending on what the norms are, we may have more respect for them than not. I'm gonna pause there to see if there are any questions or comments as we've covered a lot of material so far. And we'll see if there are any comments or questions or clarifications needed there. All right, cool. So now let's look at why it is that we may have this conformity. So we look at two types of social influence. We have normative social influence, going along with others in pursuit of social approval or belonging and to avoid disapproval and rejection. And that's what we saw in the ask conformity studies. And we may see this in things like clothing choices. We don't want to get disapproved of or, or, or reject it. So we do it to get along. So we seek social approval and belonging to that group. Or it could be informational social influence. Going along with others because their ideas and behavior make sense, the evidence in our social environment changes our mind. So the idea is, if you think about it this way, sometimes you may behave a certain way because you may think they may have more information than you do. Let's say you leave a building on campus and you see there's a bunch of people sort of like in a circle around something and you go join them as people often will do and you join them and you see somebody on the ground maybe and then you start looking at the group of people that you're just you just joined because you're trying to get information from them to say what the world's going on here or you may even ask them what the world's going on here the idea is that you're looking for information to influence what you may do next, what you may decide to do. So these are the two social influence types, normative social influence, you go along in pursuit of social approval or go along with others because their ideas and behaviors make sense. They may have more information than you do, okay? Now let's talk about obedience, the big one, obedience. Uh, obedience is this. Response to commands. Milgram wanted to study the influence of direct commands on behavior. Why did he want to study this? So this was around the 60s, and we need to understand what had happened a few decades previous. A few decades before Milgram, uh, in Milgram's lifespan here and lifetime, uh, there was World War II. And in World War II, it was revealed what the Nazi party had done as part of their final solution uh, by opening concentration camps around uh, the world 
to systematically try to get rid of people who were not like them, people who had uh, these beliefs or these infirmities or these physical or uh, mental uh, issues. And they systematically murdered them and killed them. And so he wanted to find out why did people obey? Now, during the trials, uh, war crime trials, uh, crimes against humanity trials that happened after World War II, there was this phrase that you would hear quite often when they would ask this former German officer, uh, why did you do this? They would say, does anybody know what they would say when they were asked why they did what they did during this particular time? Anyone know the phrase that they would normally repeat? Okay, what they would normally repeat. I'm not, I'm not familiar. Okay, they were going to say, I was following orders. That was it. I was following orders. And so that led many to believe, okay, would people just simply follow orders to harm and or kill innocent people? Milgram wanted to know, and that's why Milgram set up the experiment he did. So Milgram, the question, under what social conditions are people likely to obey commands given them? The experiment. An authority figure tells participants to administer shocks to a learner, actually a confederate of the researcher. So the person identified as the learner was actually working with the experimenter uh, when the learner gives wrong answer. So if the learner gives the wrong answer, he would receive a shock. The voltages increased. How high would people go? That's what they were curious in. They wanted to know if people would go to the maximum number of shocks and how many would go to that maximum number. So these individuals completed all the surveys and forms, to make sure they were psychologically healthy, so to speak, and they wanted to see what would happen. Now, this is the way the experiment was designed. So we have the layout here. We have the learner on the, the left screen there. He's being strapped down into his chair. Okay, to the right, we see the diagram where the learner is. He's sort of like in a, a room blocked off there. We have the experimenter, I mean, the experimenter in the upper right corner doing paperwork, I, I assume there. And then at the bottom is gonna be the true subject of the experiment, the teacher. The teacher is the one who would have to flip the switch when the learner gave a wrong answer. So it goes something like this. He would give him a, read a list of things and then the learner was supposed to say the right answer. And if he didn't say the right answer, the, the teacher would say something like incorrect and flip a switch. Bzzz, and then the learner would go, ow, something like that. And they had a whole scenario where at one point the learner would say, let me out of here. I want to stop, stop this experiment now. And the researcher would give them orders to continue. All right. At the very bottom, you can see what was labeled on the device that was giving the shocks. Slight all the way to the very end, XXX was 435 to 450 volts. Okay, so that's the layout of the experiment that we saw. Compliance in the Milgram study, what we saw was this. In surveys, most people predict that in such a situation, they would stop administering shocks when the learner expressed pain. So most people said, no, I'll stop as soon as they express that they were having discomfort. Guess what? That's not what actually happened. But in reality, even when the learner complained of a heart condition, most people complied with the experimenter's directions. All the experimenter or researcher would have to do would be this. Please continue. You must continue. The experiment requires that you continue. And that was all. So when all was said and done, this is what happened. Over 65% or approximately 65% of everyone who went through this experiment, this initial experiment, went to the very end. The majority of participants continued to obey and flipped the switch for 435 to 450 volts. They would shock them. So that was shocking to a lot of people that this is what the results indicated that yes, people who are basically psychologically healthy, given the right circumstances and situations, will hurt an innocent person by flipping a switch and making an electrical shock go through their body. So what factors increase obedience? 
Well, they found out the following. When orders were given by someone with legitimate authority, someone associated with a prestigious institution, and someone was standing close by. When the learner and victim is in another room, so you don't have to see them. When other participants obey in or no one disobeys, so there's no role model for defiance. And other evidence of the power of obedience. The bad news is this, in war, some people at the beginning choose not to fight and kill, but after that, obedience escalates even in killing innocent people. The good news, obedience can also strengthen heroism. Soldiers and others risk of even sacrifice themselves more so when, other, uh, when, when under orders. So what we see is the following thing. Now, I used to ask this question all the time. Now, most of you may not be as familiar with World War II and all this type of stuff, but in order for it to happen the way it did, uh, when the German uh, Nazi party rose to power uh, in Germany, people had to agree with some of the things they were doing, or at least not complain about it. And some people would say, when I was teaching this class years ago, that they would stand up to the party when they were taking over. And I say, what would that do? I mean, obviously, if you stand up to people who have all the guns and control, they could easily just get rid of you. There's no problem with that. So oftentimes, people need to realize that when the system does change, it's very difficult because you have to sort of like sacrifice yourself in order to try to be disobedience. But obedience can be controlled, okay, in that people who have control of the system, they can hurt and kill even those people who are disobedient. So when Milgram did these studies and Ash did his studies, there were several lessons that were learned from the conformity and the obedient studies. Uh, when under pressure to conform or obey, ordinary principled people will say and do things they never would have believed they would do. To look a person committing harmful acts and assume that the person is cruel or evil would be to make a fundamental attribution error. The real evil may be in the situation. And that's what a lot of psychology does indicate, particularly social psychology, is that the situation that you find yourself in really does influence what you will do. You may wind up doing something you never thought possible. Okay, Some of, one of you may be the nicest person in the world, but given the correct situation, you can do some stuff that you never thought that you would be able to do. Now, one of the other things too that I wanna emphasize as well that is not indicated here, but this was another finding too, is that quote, evil or really bad scenarios that people wind up in never happens in one fell swoop. Stuff happens incrementally in small steps, in small stages. So you may wind up doing some sort of evil because of the situation, but you didn't start out doing that. You did one thing that was slightly a little bit gray, then maybe something that was a little bit darker, and then something that was a little bit really questionable, and then the next thing you know, you're doing something that may be atrocious. But the idea here is that from these studies, we finally realized the question that Milgram had at the very beginning is that yes, people who are psychologically healthy, they will, under the right circumstances, hurt innocent people. And that's what this study and these group of studies told us. All right, are there any questions or comments before we wrap it up for the day? Anybody? Okay, so when we get back here, we'll get back into our examination of social psychology by uh, picking up where we left off. Uh, that's it for now, okay? You guys are free to get out of here. And if you guys showed up a little bit late, please send me a present so I know that uh, you were here so you can be accounted for attendance. All right, you guys have a great day. And I'll see you guys uh, on Thursday. Bye.